So this Friday, this last Friday, marked the first day of fall, September 22nd. How many of you are excited about that? <laughs> so uh, that means summer's over, right? No, it means the weather is getting cooler. Uh, for some of you, though, you are excited. Fall is maybe your favorite season, or it's hunting season, right? Yay! For some, that's pretty exciting. Um, but uh, for almost all of us, whether fall is exciting or not, um, one thing fall does mean is it means back at things, back to the grind, back to, to, to uh, you know, all of the stuff that, that fall has, work, school, schedules, deadlines, um, kids in sports and calendars and agendas, and there's a kind of a hecticness or a busyness that just naturally comes with the fall seasons. And uh, that highlights one of the main challenges that we have in navigating life on this planet, navigating the lives that we have, and that is how do we handle the tensions, the stresses, the chaos, the trials, the busyness of life? How do we handle all of that in a way that we can stay healthy, alive, energized, um, instead of getting kind of snowed under by it all? <laughs> uh, one guy said it this way. He said, our lives are overloaded. So many of us are left tired, exhausted, worn out, burned out, lost, confused, dazed, on edge, rushed, and stressed. This is the way of the world we live in, but it, was not, it is not the way of our Lord. And sadly, God's people have sometimes been more like the world than like the one who set an example for us of joy and peace, not stress and anxiety. So this is what I want to talk about today in our time together in God's Word is how do you and I burn brightly in, in chaotic seasons of our lives without burning out? How do we go on the, the road trip of life with all its twists and winds and ups and downs? How do we do that without ending up sidelined with an empty tank of gas somewhere along the way? Because the challenge is when our schedules get full, sometimes it causes our hearts to get empty. When, when our lives get cluttered up, sometimes we get lost in the middle of that clutter uh, and uh, that, that can uh, do a number of damaging things to us. One of them is that actually those worries and cares, they can end up bringing kind of toxins into us. Um, anxiety, worry, tension, hurry, overload. Um, these are not just, uh, uh, you know, sort of neutral things. These are toxic things. And when they fill our hearts, our hearts don't have room for peace and for joy and for patience and for kindness and those kind of things that, of course, we're called to live with. Another thing that the cares and concerns of life can do is they can end up just wearing us out. Uh, I love how Charles Swindoll says this. He says, the only trouble with success is that the formula for achieving it is the same as the formula for a nervous breakdown, right? And whoa. Um, and, and that's just reality. When we live frazzled, stressed out, hurried, anxious lives, we are living below what God has intended for us. God has better things for his children on this side of heaven. He invites us to live abundant lives. And, and that means lives that are filled with peace and joy, um, that know a, a kind of richness, not that's necessarily from our circumstances, because I think it is possible to live that in the midst of chaos. But you know, I love how Augustine said this. He said, the glory of God is a person fully alive. Isn't that an interesting statement? The glory of God is a person fully alive. In other words, when you and I are living full lives, rich lives, the kind of lives that God intended us to live, not so much, again, in our circumstances, but in our hearts, we reveal the goodness of God. We become testimonies of who God is and how God uh, works in our lives. Um, wh one more thing that, that uh, these chaos of life can create in us is it can end up diminishing our faith. Um, I think this is one of the greatest dangers for Western Christianity. John Orpert puts it like this, for most of us, the great danger is not that we will renounce our faith, it's that we'll, be, we'll become so distracted and rushed and pre preoccupied that we will settle for a mediocre version of it, Right? I remember a while back I got to speak to a group of 500 men out at a men's conference. This was the main point I wanted to address with those men. And I just said, man, if, if, if Satan can't make you bad, he'll just make you busy, right? I think for a lot of Christian men, they, 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 they're probably not in, in any short-range um, danger of shipwrecking their faith but they are in danger of just skimming their lives rather than really living our lives. We're in danger of, of, of not, not necessarily falling in some great, spectacular way into sin, but rather just wasting our lives with frivolous pursuits. 
So what do we do? What do we do when, when we, we sense all of that coming, those toxins, that wearing, that diminishing, that kind of skimming in our faith rather than really going deep in our faith? How do we find our way through that? Oh, one guy said, I've never discovered anything as complicated as simplifying my life, right? I mean, that's complex. And I don't think just trying harder is the answer. You know, I think that's sometimes our temptation. Wow, this is really hard? I'll just try harder. Maybe that'll fix it. I always think of a guy who was uh, paddling his canoe. He got halfway across a lake, and he sprung a leak. And so, you know, there's his leak in his boat, and it's, it's starting to fill up. And so what does he do? He paddles harder, as if that's going to fix the problem, right? No, the answer is plug the hole, not paddle harder. And actually, uh, I think God addresses this many times in his word, but I love Jeremiah chapter 6. It says this, uh, this is what the Lord says. He's got a different path for you. He says, stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it. And look at what happens if you'll do that. And you will find rest for your souls. But you said, we will not walk in it. In other words, God says, there is a way. Now, it's a different way. It's a less traveled path, right? It's an ancient path. It's not the modern frenzy path, but there is a path forward where you can find rest for your souls, but you have to be willing to go God's way. So what is God's way? Well, uh, if you have a Bible and you can find it, turn to the book of Habakkuk with me. Um, you'd find that by going to Matthew and then turning right just a few pages. But Habakkuk is a little book in the Old Testament, and Habakkuk faced this very battle, the chaos of life, the stresses of life, and he learned and walked the ancient path. In fact, that's really what the book of Habakkuk is. It's a little journey through him figuring this uh, lesson out. And so it starts with him being overwhelmed by his circumstances, but by the end of Habakkuk, three chapters later, he has a total change of perspective. He goes from stress and anxiety to peace, from misery to rejoicing, from doubt to worship. And what's amazing about Habakkuk is his circumstances don't change. The chaos remains, but in him, things change. His perspective changes. So I'm going to call this message Pursuing the Presence of God because I believe this. I believe when you walk in God's presence, it changes how you view your circumstances. It changes how you approach things. Even when everything else around you is crazy, when you walk in God's presence, everything is different, at least from your perspective. So here we are, Habakkuk chapter 1. Uh, we'll see the first couple verses. This is verses, uh, chapter 1, verses uh, 1 to 4. How long, O Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen. Violence is everywhere, I cry, but you do not come to save. Must I forever see these evil deeds? Must I watch all this misery? Why must I watch all this misery? Wherever I look, I see destruction and violence. I'm surrounded by people who love to argue and fight. <laughs> Anybody ever said that? Right? The law has become paralyzed. There's no justice in the courts. The wicked far outnumber the righteous so that justice has become perverted. Habakkuk wakes up in the morning, and when he looks around, he does not like what he sees at all. There's violence and evil everywhere. There's misery and strife everywhere he looks. Wickedness and injustice fill the lands. And even God's people, God's people are, 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 aren't committed to this. And God seems nowhere to be found. It's as if God has removed himself. And, and, and uh, Habakkuk just says, this is hopeless. It's a chaotic environment that I'm living in. And he's overwhelmed by it all. It's like he's face to face with it and it's overwhelming to him. So what does he do with that? And that's really what's powerful about this book. The, the way Habakkuk is, is written, chapter one is the problem, chapter two is the solution, and chapter three is the result. And so the, the center point of the, chap, or of the book is chapter two, verses one and two. And that's gonna be the, the, what we're gonna spend our time on together in the message today, and then we'll end by looking at the result in chapter 3. But these, this is the turning point of the whole book, is these two verses right here. Chapter 2, verse 1. I will climb up. This is how I'm responding to the chaos around me. I will climb up to my watchtower and stand at my guard post. There I will wait to see what the Lord says and how he will answer my complaint. Then the Lord said to me, write my answer plainly on tablets so that a runner can carry the correct message to others. So what, 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 what did he do? I want to offer you three things that we can do in the midst of chaos to achieve peace, to pursue God's presence. And the first one is this, I must go up before I go out. 
Okay, I must go up before I go out. In other words, instead of just heading right into the muck, heading right into the stress, heading right into the problem, heading right into the busyness, I need to head a different direction first. And you would think, oh, that's pretty straightforward, but that is not easy to do. When a problem faces you, it's really hard to disengage and go up instead of engaging the problem. When stresses and anxieties come your way, when 50 million things to do are coming your way, it's not easy to just go, hey, hey, hang on a second. I love the way, I think it was Martin Luther who used to say, I have so much to do today, I need to spend extra time in prayer. Isn't that a great way to say it? It's just going, I'm not going to allow the chaos to, 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 to overwhelm me. I'm not going to allow the urgent to, to create this uh, uh, desperateness in me where I'm going to head straight into that. I'm going to go in a different direction. I'm not going to just focus on the problem. I'm not just going to stare it in the face. Uh, I'm going to choose to spend time with God first. I love how C.S. Lewis puts this. He says, the moment you wake up each morning, all your wishes and hopes of the day rush at you like wild animals. <laughs> And the first job each morning consists in shoving it all back, in listening to that other voice, taking that other point of view, uh, letting that other point of view, the stronger, larger, quieter life, come flowing in. You know, the book of Psalms is littered with this, over and over again through the book of Psalms. Uh, you'll see it starts often, or at least somewhere through the psalm, you've got th this, this set of problems. Um, sometimes the problem is enemies that the psalmist is facing, and there's people coming against them and having uh, trouble all around them. Sometimes the problem is just personal stresses and challenges. Sometimes they, uh, the psalmist has lost their way internally, and they, they, they're not sure what to believe anymore. They're not sure what, where their confidence is found anymore. They, they just can't seem to find truth. or uh, They're doubting God, and they have questions. And sometimes the psalmist is facing temptation, or even they've fallen in sin, and they're just feeling the shame of that. Whatever it is, over and over again, if you work through the Psalms, there's something overwhelming the psalmist, something that's just coming that's, that's too much to handle. And again and again, what the psalmist learns to do is instead of just being in and dwelling in the problem, because you know what? If you spend enough time with the problem, the problem becomes part of you and you become part of the problem. The psalmist learns, no, I need to move on and be with the Lord. Uh, here's how Psalm chapter 3 puts it. Oh, Lord, I have so many enemies, so many are against me, but you, O oh Lord, are the shield around me. You are my glory, the one who holds my head high. I cried out to the Lord, and look what it says. He answered me from where? From his holy mountain. He, he's taken me to a higher place, right? He's brought me up somewhere differently. Now, Isaiah chapter 2 actually says this. says, I, I, I can't wait for the day when people say, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. There he will teach us. Uh, Moses, when Moses was commanded to set up a tent where, where he would meet with God, you know what God said about it? Set up the tent outside the camp, <laughs> right? Leave the chaos and the busyness. Come and meet with me there, outside the camp. You have to get somewhere else. Uh, Albert Einstein said it this way. He said, no problem can be solved at the same level that it was created on, right? You have to get to a different place to be able to solve that. Uh, Jesus certainly taught on this, and uh, one of my favorite passages is Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 30. This is the way the message puts it. Jesus speaking, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. This is the answer. Come to me. Get away with me, and you will recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me. Work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. And you know, Jesus didn't just teach this, come to me, come away with me. He lived it. Oh, one time when things were chaotic with the disciples, the Bible says that they didn't even have time to eat. And he said, let's get away together and rest a while. In Luke chapter 5, it says this, report of Jesus' power spread even faster. Vast crowds came to hear him preach and to be healed of their diseases. Now, that was Jesus' mission. What do you think Jesus would do if fast crowds were coming and more and more people needed healing? Did Jesus grab his day timer and say, we got to schedule more meetings, right? Man, this is awesome, right? i got to wake up extra early tomorrow. Do five extra things because this is going to be great. No, you know what it says? But, but, here's how Jesus responded to the chaos, even good chaos that was around him. He often withdrew. One translation said he was in the habit of doing this to the wilderness for prayer. 
So when we have family stress, financial stress, marital stress, work stress, life stress, inner stress, whatever that is, we need to change our direction, get higher, get perspective. Even when everything in you says, no, deal with this now, run at the problem, the answer is stop, turn the other way. You know, last Sunday, we talked about God's word as a weapon in our warfare against the enemy and spiritual war. And, and I, I just said, man, we have to get God's word in us. And I urge you to develop a daily quiet time, a prayerful time in God's word. In Mark chapter 4, Jesus is talking about uh, a sower who sows seed, and he's relating that to the word of God being sown into our hearts. And this is one of the kinds of soil that Jesus describes. He says, there's seed that fell among the thorns that represents those who hear God's word. But all too quickly, the message is crowded out by what? The worries of life, the lure of wealth, the desire for other things. And here's what happens. No fruit is produced. See, here's, here's the deal for us. This world is not a bad thing. God created it. God created the, the, the stuff in this world that we, in fact, I love the way it says it in Timothy. It says, God's freely given us these things to enjoy. It's a good world that, that we've been invited to live in. Now, yeah, there's bad stuff too, but there's so much good. But here's the, that's the challenge, isn't it? There's so much good. It's not that most of these things are bad things. It's just that they make our hearts crowded. And when they make our hearts crowded, when the cares of this world and when the pleasures of life and just the stuff, the, the lure of all these things, oh, hey, hey, oh, that would be good, oh, that would be good, oh, that would be good, and pretty soon it crowds out God's work and God's word in us. In Psalm 119, David says it like this, you are my place of quiet retreat. I wait for your word to renew me. Charles Swindoll said it like this. He said, busyness substitutes shallow frenzy for deep friendship. It feeds the ego, but it starves the inner man. So if we want a full inner person, if we want a deep friendship with God, then we have to slow down, maybe even stop. And before we go into the mess, we go up and we be with God. So that's the first part. The next two things are just going to flow out of that. The second thing that Habakkuk did, he, he went up before he went out, but then he learned to wait before he ran. I must wait before I run. Habakkuk says there, I'll climb my watchtower, I'll stand at my guard post. That, you know, that's not a literal watchtower or guide post, right? It's, it, Habakkuk didn't have one of those. He's talking about going up to his place of prayer, but he says there, I will wait, I will wait to see what the Lord says and how he answers my complaint. Now, here's the deal. None of us like waiting, right? We like waiting about as much as we like getting our teeth drilled at the dentist. It's not pleasant. How many of you hate to wait? Just say, yeah, that's me. You know what waiting is like? Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's like that. And it's awkward, right? And it creates this space, this vacuum that you're just like something, anything, fill the space. And that's actually what waiting does. Waiting creates a vacuum for God to fill the space. It's a way of saying, God, you fill the space. I'm not going to fill it with anything else. And the Bible places a high value on waiting. So before we run headlong into the problems with our rifles cocked, our guns blazing, we wait. Before we frantically race into the problem, we, 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 we uh, stop and say, I'm going to think, I'm going to reflect, I'm going to be with God. And waiting reminds us, hey, I'm not God, I, I'm not the savior of the world, I, I'm not the one holding the world in my hands. Uh, waiting brings us to a place of dependence, of, of surrender. We're just saying, God, I, you're, you're my supply, you're my source, you're the one I need. Psalm chapter 40 says, I waited patiently for the Lord to help me. He turned and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and mire, set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked along. See, when, when he was in the pit and in the muck and in the mire, I'm sure he tried to crawl out, but he doesn't talk about that here. He says, I learned that I needed to cry out to God and wait on God. That was how I got out. That was what changed. 
And over and over again in Scripture, God just pleads with his people, if only you'd wait on me. If only you'd look to me. If only you'd turn your attention that way. And, and just so you know, waiting, waiting is, is, is not a, a passive thing. Okay, I think I have this a little bit later in our slide, but the, the, the great theologian Winnie the Pooh, you guys ever heard of him? Um, he had this almost right here. Okay? He says, don't underestimate the value of doing nothing, just going along, listening to all the things you can't hear, and not bothering. He's so close. There is value in stopping and waiting. But waiting isn't just doing nothing. Waiting on God is, is turning to God. It's weaving our souls in with God. It's saying, God, I'm looking to you, and I'm not looking any other direction, and here I will wait until you answer me, until you answer me. In Isaiah chapter 30, uh, God pleads with his people there and just says, look, it's in returning to me and resting in me that you're going to find your salvation. It's in quietness and rest that you'll find strength. And you know what it says there? Just like in a previous passage we looked at, it says, but you wouldn't. You said, no, we will run away on horses. Is the way it says it in Isaiah 30. You're just going to, you're, you're, you're running every direction. And you'd have done far better if you'd have just waited. Isaiah 40, 30, and 31, even youths faint and be, shall faint and be weary. Young men will utterly fall, but those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings as eagles, run and not be weary, walk and not faint. So, I'll go up before I go down. I will wait before I run. And then here's the last one. I will listen before I speak. I'll listen before I speak. He says, I'm going to go up to my watchtower, my guard post. There I will wait to see what the Lord says and how he will answer my complaint. How is God going to answer me? I'm going to listen to him. Of course, James says we need to learn to be uh, quick to listen and slow to speak. Quick to listen, slow to speak. And, you know, when you think about God's voice in Scripture, how does God speak? He speaks in the quietness. He speaks in the stillness. He speaks when he actually has our attention. Right? You remember that when Elijah learned that lesson, that it wasn't the, the, the wind and the storms. And if you haven't read that story yet, dig up in your Bible, you know, the, the story of Elijah and, and study that through. It's fascinating uh, what he learns about how God speaks in, in this whisper when we're ready to hear. And so many times we can't hear God just because the switchboard is jammed. There's too many things going on. It's like the guy, was, his plane was going down and he kept calling for help. But every time he would call for help, he'd change the channel. Call for help, change the channel. Call for help, change the channel. Nobody could answer him. You know, my kids, they're, they're fast texters. You ever find when somebody's texting you and then you go to answer them, but before you can get the answer out, they've texted you again? And then you go to answer that, and they text you again, and pretty soon there's four things they've texted you, and now it doesn't even make sense to answer. You're like, well, which one am I answering, right? Just give them a call, right? <laughs> Man, I'll tell you, I think sometimes when we're trying to talk to God, it's like that. God, how come you don't do this and this and this? God, what's going on in my life here? God, what are you trying to teach me there? God, blah, 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 right? And what about, and God, wouldn't you please? And God this and God that. And, and you know, God's going, oh. <laughs> all right, you just talk. I'll just listen. <laughs> you know, for me, when I go to spend time in prayer, my mind often races. And it takes time for all those thoughts and all that racing to kind of settle down and just go, okay, now I can listen. For, for me, this, this piece right here, um, you know, it'll, it'll often take <laughs> quite a while before... All of that chaos, just the RPMs can slow down enough that I can hear what it is that God would want to say, that I get some clarity. In fact, it's interesting, the very next verse, God speaks and he says, write the vision, make it plain, make it plain, make it clear so that the person who gets it can run with it. You know what happens when we finally are quiet enough to hear God? We get clarity. Isn't that what we're looking for in the chaos and the stress and the insanity of it all? Isn't it amazing when, when you're facing problems and battles and all this chaos and somebody can come in with one sentence and speak clarity to it? 
what we call in Scripture a word in season. And you just go, oh, there we go. That's what I needed to hear. Isaiah chapter 50 describes this. says, the sovereign Lord has given me a well-instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary, a word in season for the weary. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being instructed. So Isaiah goes, I'm able to, to go out and find people in chaos, find people in weariness, and speak a word to them of life, speak a word to them that will sustain them. How am I able to do that? Morning by morning, God wakens my ear to listen. Morning by morning, I'm able to get instruction from God. So when the chaos of life hits, here's the ancient path. The ancient path is before I go down, I'm going to go up. Before I wait, uh, or sorry, before I run, I'm going to wait. And before I speak, I'm going to listen. Never forget a number of years ago, I heard uh, a gentleman preaching called Dr. George Hill. He's the founder of Victory Churches. He's going to be coming for our men's conference. And he was sharing one time about uh, going to plant a church, and they'd been working on it and working on it, and things were going sideways, and there was chaos all around him. The church wasn't working the way that they had hoped, and um, they had problems uh, in their church. They had problems in the whole victory movement that they were trying to handle and deal with. And, and I mean, stress after stress after stress. And, and he just said it, it was like everything was caving in around him and he couldn't sleep. And then this thought hit him while he was lying in bed. Hey, wait a second. I know how to get my peace back. And that little phrase has always stuck with me. I know how to get my peace back. And he said he got up, went out to his chair, and he spent some time in prayer. Spend some time with the Lord until he got his peace back. But here's my question, church. Do you know how to get your peace back? Habakkuk learned it. Habakkuk learned that the path to peace in the midst of chaos is to spend time in the presence of God. Listening, not talking. Reflecting, not just reacting. Waiting, not running. And that really what that comes down to is what we would just call a prayer life. A time with God in prayer in God's Word. Um, I really honestly believe uh, that it is possible, it's possible to face the stresses and the challenges of life. And church, we all have them. I mean, we could go around this room from one person to the next, and they look different for all of us. But uh, for every one of us, there are, are stresses and challenges we face. You know, just find a young mom with some toddlers, right? And look at the chaos of that. Uh, find a, a, a person who's getting a little older and how many times they have to go to the doctor and deal with this thing and that thing and that thing and that thing, right? And those things are in their face every day. Uh, relational things, job things. I mean, we all have them. I'm convinced it is possible to be people of joy and peace, to be people that are life-giving in the midst of a, a life-sucking kind of world. I think it's possible to be vibrant and alive instead of overloaded. And the way is to develop a vibrant and robust prayer life. That's the way. So look how Habakkuk ends. Habakkuk chapter 3, this is verses 17 to 19, the last verses of the book of Habakkuk. Even though the fig trees have no blossoms, and there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails, and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields, and the cattle barns are empty. In other words, even if my worst nightmare takes place, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. He's figured this out now. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. The sovereign Lord is my strength. And look what he does. He makes me as sure-footed as the deer, able to tread on the heights. He's gotten above the clouds now. Now he can see the forest, not just the trees. He's gotten a new perspective, completely different scene from the first few verses of Habakkuk. The circumstances are the same, but he's changed. He's no longer anxious over his problems. His thoughts aren't filled with the chaos around him. He's been lifted higher. His hope is in God. He's found God to be his strength and his joy. He's discovered that he was made not just to live in that chaos, but to live on a higher plane. He's gone from complaining to confidence, from doubt to trust. Instead of focusing on his problems. And notice, he doesn't deny the problems. He doesn't even make light of them or pretend they're not there. He just finds God sufficient in the midst of the problems. I want to be like that. 
I want to be like that. And I want you to be like that. And the way to it is the ancient path. To cultivate God's presence. Um, to just take a daily time and just say, okay, every day, every day, I'm going to open God's word. I'm going to open it, not just to read a book. I'm going to open God's word and say, oh God, would you speak to me today? Would you help me quiet my soul? One, I think it's Psalm 131, if I have it right. It just says, like a weaned child, I've quieted my soul within me. I'm going to quiet my soul. I'm going to slow down the RPMs of my life. And I'm going to breathe in, drink in the life of God, the strength of God, the peace of God. I'm going to invite God to speak into my situation. And then from there, it's not that we don't have to head down into the valley. It's not that we don't have to face the problems and the trials and the challenges that our life has. It's not that, that, you know, oh, wow, I'm just living above the clouds. There's no chaos in my life. Everything's perfect. That's not what the life in Christ is like. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. I've overcome the world. It's the words of Jesus. So here's today's takeaway. I can rise above the chaos of life by spending time in God's presence, waiting on and listening to him.